This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Our next speaker is uh, Brian Lee, and uh, his uh, talk is the living kidney donor. It's not always black and white. In fact, very frequently it's gray. And it is how to navigate the gray zones that uh, is, poses a, a frequent challenge to us, because uh, while we want to maximize living transplantation, living donor transplantation, at the same time, we want to ensure the short-term and long-term safety of our kidney donors. And so he'll be discussing uh, the various algorithms that we have in place on how to select patients that fall in these uh, sometimes pretty challenging uh, gray zones. Brian? Well, thank you very much uh, for attending this meeting. And um, thanks for the uh, very kind introduction, Dr. Finchanti. Um, the uh, talk that I was actually charged with this time was um, living kidney donation. It's not always black and white, uh, but in fact, I think I'm going to take a little spin and a little liberty with this title, um, and I think it will probably be more appropriately called living kidney donation. It's rarely black and white. Uh, most things that we deal with is uh, primarily gray, um, and I want to kind of come, go, uh, go over some of those with you um, and share with you some of the experiences that we've garnered in the last few years. Uh, so just a disclosure slide. Um, I checked the UNOS website not too long ago, and um, I'm sure that every one of you are acutely aware that the uh, waiting list is not getting any shorter for kidney transplant. And I think this was uh, downloaded on Monday, uh, and as of 11 a.m. that day, uh, there were about 72,000 patients uh, who were active on the uh, UNOS kidney transplant wait list. Um, if you look at the number of uh, living donors uh, in the country, uh, I think if you just primarily focus on our area here, um, California being one of the more populous states, um, compared to our neighboring states, apart from Nevada, where you know we were probably doing a little better job, our donation rates are really not that good um, overall. Um, and, um, and I think there's much to be said about it, and we can do better. Uh, the number of living kidney donors um, had actually increased, uh, and by 2001, I believe, uh, the number of living donors had actually exceeded the number of deceased donors. But for some reason, between 01 to 04, there's been a steady rise, and then from 04 onwards, uh, there's been a slow decline in the number of living donors, the reasons of which are not really clear. Um, and more interestingly, the trend had been that previously living donors tend to be blood-related individuals, um, but uh, there's been an increase in the number of um, biologically unrelated uh, donors, but who might be emotionally related, for example, spouse and partners. Um, I don't think I need to... Uh, it's, uh, you kind of hammer this in any more than what Dr. Roberts has already said. Uh, the outcomes one year, five year, and ten year for living donors uh, far exceed those of uh, f deceased donors. And I think the next slide basically gives you a little comparison there. Uh, and so there's, you know, basically a, a, a every single reason that we should try to push for living don donation in every single one of our recipient patients. So I want to kind of share with you basically three areas that uh, we primarily have a lot of interest in uh, and we see a, a, a good number of patients who have these uh, problems. Um, the first one of which is the hypertensive donors and I'm going to be sharing sharing with you, you know, the lion's share of the time is going to be spent on this because that's basically the, the most you know, often seen problem. Uh, and then I want to kind of go over with you, if we, if time permits, um, how we would deal with patients who's got isolated hematuria and those who had nephrolithiasis. 
So this is probably a fairly good review. Um, you know, re relatively recent 2006 meta-analyses looking at what are the risks of developing hypertension in patients who, uh, who um, uh, had previously served as a donor. Um, they basically did a meta-analysis of about 48 studies, which spans about 28 countries and had a total of over about 5,000 adults. Average age uh, of the uh, patients involved was about 41. They were all normal tensive at the time of um, uh, their enrollment. Uh, the follow-up period was at least for five years and ranged anywhere between 16, uh, six to 13 years in duration. And um, they had two reviewers who basically independently abstracted the studies from um, the data from each of the studies. And uh, basically what ultimately it showed, uh, to try to just cut to the chase, was that when they pulled over all the estimates from the four, four or five studies that they, they could, uh, in terms of the systolic blood pressure, over about six to 13 years, there was found to be an increase of six millimeters of mercury in the systolic pressure in those who had previously served as a donor compared to a, a control population, which is not explained away, obviously, by just aging alone. And they, when they looked at the um, outcomes for the diastolic pressure, it was a similar pattern, four to five uh, millimeters of mercury increase over the controls. Um, looking at the risk of developing hypertension if you had previously served as a donor, compared to you know, if you were either just a healthy individual and never donated, um, there was only one study in which there was a statistical significance and it just barely made significance here. Um, and uh, they gave a relative risk of about 1.9. So you can argue that maybe there's a twice, a two, two-fold increased risk of developing hypertension if you had previously served as a living donor. Um, the study itself is obviously by the nature of the fact that it's a meta-analysis, limited by the fact that um, a lot of the data was collected retrospectively, uh, and that the development of hypertension might actually be underestimate, an underestimation because, you know, uh, at least five years of follow-up, um, but you know some of them might have been too short for for picking up the true prevalence and the incidence of hypertension. Uh, in most of those studies, about a third of the patients were actually lost to follow-up, so they don't really have a lot of data on those who didn't continue to be followed up, and they didn't know what their out true outcomes were. Um, they used a basically a a, a, a vanilla. Uh, group of patients to serve as controls. Uh, it would have been a lot better if they could use uh, patients who were specifically selected uh, such that they represent transplant eligible, uh, but uh, patients who didn't go on to donate a kidney uh, and follow them prospectively along with the, uh, the study patients. But obviously that's uh, not something that the meta-analysis meta could do. Um, looking at some of the older data, um, this was a paper back in 1987. Um, this group followed about 99 living donors, and they followed them up for in excess of 10 years. Um, the definition back then for hypertension, um, as we well know now, uh, was a little, a little bit more liberal, 160 over 95, uh, whereas borderline hypertension was just defined as somebody whose blood pressure was more than 140 over 90, but not uh, definitively hypertensive. And basically what they found was before they donated, um, about a quarter of patients had either borderline hypertension, 22%, uh, and only 4% of them were definitively hypertensive. And then, you know, fast forward 10 years, uh, and you see that, you know, obviously the donors had gotten older, um, and that the sh shift in the balance was that up to about 35% of uh, the previous donors are now either borderline or definitively hypertensive. Uh, and the proportion of patients who, had, who were definitively hypertensive has gone up to about 21%. So that's not an insignificant number. So they compared it to basically uh, what they would define as a control population using NHANES data. Uh, and this was you know, the group that spanned 71 to 74, uh, and they were primarily Caucasian. Uh, and what they found was overall, the, the percentage of definitively hypertensive patients were higher in previous donors. But cumulatively, the, those who had either borderline and definitive uh, hypertension were, were the same, uh, whether it, it was a non-donor population or previous donor population. Um, and the risk factors that they've identified, and this is just basically a, a graphic representation, the older you were at the time of donation, the higher your um, BMI, uh, and also the higher your mean arterial pressure at, at the time of donation, the more likely you're gonna develop hypertension afterwards, um, which you know, stands to reason. 
And they found that patients who pre-donation had either borderline or definitive hypertension um, go, on, go on to develop hypertension definitively after, at, at follow-up up in up to 37 and a half percent of patients whereas those who were normal tensive to begin with um, at follow-up only had only 15 percent of them were definitively hypertensive at follow-up um, and they basically hypothesized that donation may accelerate the development of hypertension in those who already had a genetic predisposition um, most of the blood pressure readings that we do are uh, basically the ones that we obtain at random uh, when the patient's coming into clinic or you know when they're going to the local Walgreens and getting a blood pressure check there um, but increasingly a lot of investigators have noticed that maybe an ambulatory blood pressure would be a much better way to make a diagnosis of hypertension uh, and what this study did was they compared 24 hour blood pressure ambulatory readings to three random blood pressure readings in potential kidney donors uh, and they basically correlated this because you know Blood pressure is important, but ultimately what we care about is end organ, dam uh, end organ target damage. Uh, and so uh, they correlated this with hypertensive changes on the retinal exam uh, and also uh, LVH by echo criteria. Uh, they introduced this concept of BP load. Basically what it means is the percentage of the daytime readings that were in excess of 140 over 90 and also nighttime reading blood pressures that were in excess of 120 over 80. Um, thinking that that was what the stress to the cardiovascular system was, was seeing. And what this graph basically summarizes is that it looks like the ambulatory blood pressure, at, at least in the living kidney donor population, beats out the random clinic uh, readings. Uh, 126 patients, um, when you were doing clinic readings, 37 of them were found to be hypertensive. But when they applied 24-hour blood pressure monitor to them, uh, 13 of these patients, so a third of them, were actually reclassified as being normal tensive. And only the remaining 24 were, remained uh, hypertensive after the ambulatory blood pressure readings um, and to kind of verify this none of these 13 patients had any retinal damage or LVH by echo criteria um, and likewise on the on, on the corollary um, those who were deemed to be normal tensive by clinic blood pressure readings when they applied the 24-hour blood pressure criteria on them six of them were actually found to be hypertensive and when they did the retinal exam and, and uh, echocardiogram they were actually found to have hypertensive retinal damage and also LVH um, so um, nowhere is the blood pressure reading um, more important in um, a population of patients um, who are older. Uh, and this is increasingly um, of importance because we are accepting uh, donors who are you know, basically increasing in age. Um, this particular group at the Mayo Clinic looked at about 240 potential kidney donors who ranged in age between 18 to 72, and they divided up into three groups, those who were younger than 35, 36 to about 50, and those who were older than 50. Um, they used clinic blood pressure uh, readings uh, using the usual oxalometric um, Dynamap machines. Um, a blood pressure reading that was administered and checked by a hypertensive trained uh, nurse and also ambulatory blood pressure readings. And again, this time round, they basically defined hypertension as 140 over 90, um, and um, or if you had an ambulatory blood pressure average awake readings that was in excess of 135 over 85. And interestingly, what they found uh, was that uh, amongst the, um, the, the patients who were diagnosed with hypertension uh, based on the clinic blood pressure readings, 37% of them had hypertension. But when you apply the criteria of ambulatory blood pressure, only a th well, less than a third of them were still hypertensive at that point. So you could potentially, if you were to rule out every single hypertensive donor, you would have ruled out a lot more patients if you relied on uh, random clinic readings as opposed to applying 24-hour blood pressure monitors on these patients. And what they found was that the variability in the blood pressure readings between the clinic and the ambulatory recordings um, and the potential for mis misclassifying patients as hypertensive was greatest uh, in those who were more than 50. Um, and um, what they also wanted to illustrate with this uh, was that um, ultimately what the recipient's 
GFR at one month post transplant really mirrored the GFR of their donors uh, prior to um, prior to the uh, the donation surgery itself, um, and when they broke it out into those who were normal tensive and hypertensive by all three different measurements, um, the creatinine values um, at a mean follow-up of 581 days was really no different whether you got a kidney from a hypertensive or a normal tensive donor. So basically that led to uh, the group um, utilizing this data to come up with a hypertensive donor protocol um, where they had 148 uh, kidney donors and 24 of them were actually hypertensive pre-donation. Um, Hypertensive donors tended to be older, and also uh, they were heavier as well to start off with. Um, the antihypertensive regimen that um, the hypertensive donors were on were either an ARB plus minus a diuretic. Um, and the hypertensive donors had actually had to satisfy every single criteria that would be required of all kidney donors, including GFR cutoffs, urinary protein and microalbumin cutoffs, before they could proceed on to donation. What they found was that if you uh, divide them up uh, into the hypertensive donors uh, versus the normal tensive donors to start off with, um, at follow-up, um, blood pressure readings six to 12 months after the surgery, um, there's actually a slight decline in the blood pressure within the uh, hypertensive cohort, uh, whereas it really didn't change after donation in those who are normal tensive. Um, and um, if you uh, looked at the um, mean GFR and also the amount of proteinuria as well, pre-donation and after donation, it really wasn't much of a change or a difference uh, between those who were hypertensive or those who were normal tensive. And again, uh, they looked at the GFR and also the creatinine in the recipients who got the various kidneys from hypertensive and also normal tensive donors. Uh, and really, there were no difference between the two groups. Um, and so much so that because this was a very closely followed group of the 24 hypertensive donors um, who started off the study, 86 of them achieved gold blood pressure readings per, uh, per RN um, checkups, and 56% um, of them um, had satisfac satisfactory control by ambulatory blood pressure readings afterwards. So that basically uh, set the groundwork for um, the hypertensive uh, donor protocols that we apply at UCSF. Um, in order to be included, um, our donors had to be non-African American. Again and again, there's been studies that show the risk of developing uh, kidney disease, um, be it CKD or end-stage renal disease, um, if you were hypertensive, was much higher if you were African American compared to uh, if you were Caucasian, um, and, and, and therefore the exclusion criteria. Um, you had to be greater than 50 years of age, um, primarily because they felt that if at, by the time you're 50, uh, if you were going to develop any or, N organ target damage, uh, you would have manifested by then. Um, hypertension for less than 10 years in duration, a BMI that was less than 30, uh, and you had to achieve normal blood pressure readings on a single antihypertensive medications plus minus a diuretic, pretty much modeled on the male group. Um, and the required workup includes a 24-hour blood pressure monitor, 24-hour um, urine collection for microalbumin excretion, myocardial stress test, an echocardiogram looking for LVH, and also retinal exam looking for hypertensive changes. Uh, as mentioned earlier on, the antihypertensive regimen, uh, what is allowed is usually one agent, and um, we're not as strict about the fact that that one agent has to be an ARB. We've got patients who are on beta blocker uh, or an ACE inhibitor, plus minus a thiazide diuretic. Um, the 24-hour blood pressure monitor, um, as mentioned earlier on, the BP load uh, was a new concept that was introduced, uh, and our requirement was that the daytime readings um, had to be uh, less than 140 over 90, uh, and also nighttime readings had to be less than 130 over 80 uh, in over 80% of the readings. So you could only have 20% of your readings that were in excess of these uh, during the day and nighttime in order for you to pass the, the hypertensive donor protocol. Um, and donors who are hypertensive and not controlled at the time of the identification and workup could then be controlled and be treated with one of these medications. Uh, and a repeat evaluation, it previously was six months, but I think that's probably a, a longer than, 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 than what would be decided period if we're trying to get our recipients uh, through to, to transplant as soon as possible. So I think we've laxened it up a little bit, uh, and we're saying that if you can get controlled within four to six weeks, we can potentially reconsider that donor um, as, a, as a potential living donor.
So moving on, um, what would you do with patients who's got isolated hematuria? For example, um, we recently about had a 28-year-old healthy lady who presented as a living donor to her mom. Um, the recipient's end-stage renal disease was really unknown. The only family history was that a grandmother had diabetes. The workup on the donor showed persistent microscopic hematuria, uh, and she had normal renal function, normal tensive, uh, upper and lower GI tract examination was completely normal. And just to get a rough show of hands, how many of you would pass this donor through to donation without any further workup? Okay, see Dr. Ram's hand there. Okay. Um, um, what I wanted to kind of bring up was the fact that up to about 8 to 21% of the general population actually has a symptomatic microscopic hematuria. So it's not an uncommon finding. Um, this group examined about 500 uh, donors, and they found that about 2.7% of uh, patients actually had persistent hematuria over the duration of uh, a month. Um, in a Japanese group did mass screening, and they found that 4% of adult male and also 10% of adult females had hematuria uh, at baseline as well. And their definition of persistent hematuria was defined as more than three red blood cells on high power field by microscopy in at least two properly collected specimens a month apart. So most of the uh, programs that um, have an algorithm for workup of microscopic hematuria looks something like this. Um, basically, you do a detailed family history looking for any you know, predisposition for kidney problems, 24-hour uh, urine collection for stone workup to see if they might have some microlithiasis, um, cystoscopy, cytology, and a CT um, angiogram looking for upper and lower GI, uh, GU tract issues. Um, and then if there's no obvious urologic uh, problems for the hematuria, then intensive counseling with the do potential donor um, takes place, uh, and they either get deferred and they go back to the primary care physician for follow-up, or if they were hell-bent on being a living donor, then the next step would really be a kidney biopsy. Um, and the three most, and I want to just primarily concentrate on this, the three most common things that we see at biopsy in somebody who's got otherwise normal kidney function and isolated hematuria is thin basement membrane nephropathy, um, uh, Alport syndrome, either in the early stage or as a carrier state, uh, and IgA nephropathy. So, um, you know, basically this table differentiates and, and breaks it down into the three different issues that you're going to see at biopsy. Um, and, um, you know, by taking a thorough uh, history and physical examination, you're going to be able to isolate any family history of deafness and also um, um, uh, lens dislocation that might be more indicative uh, of an Alport syndrome uh, phenotype. Um, and when you look at the uh, electromicroscopy um, based on a biopsy, the Alport patients are going to get uh, lamination uh, of their um, of the basement me membrane, which you're not going to see in either the IgA or the thin basement membrane. Um, and when you do histo immunohistochemistry staining, uh, the alpha three to alpha five chain uh, would either be absent in the Alport patient or very patchy. Although that's not a a, 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 a very sensitive uh, sensitive. Uh, 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 finding because there's a substantial number of patients who are either in early stage or uh, carrier state who actually has normal staining for um, the collagen four. So would anyone uh, hazard a guess as to what a donor had on biopsy? So yeah, so we went ahead and did a biopsy and she turned out that she had thin basement membrane. So is there really a population in whom um, it's safe to move forward with donation uh, once you've been diagnosed with thin basement membrane disease? Well, it traditionally was called benign familial uh, hematuria. So if it's benign, why do we even care about it? Well, as it turns out that um, 35 to 50% of uh, thin basement membrane patients go on to develop hypertension, and of them, 15 to 21% become proteinuria as well. Um, looking at the Limburg registry, I think in the Netherlands, 50% uh, of, of patients who presented with primary FSGS and also hematuria actually had th thin basement membrane as well when you look at the EM. And 5% of patients who had thin basement membrane presents with nephrotic range proteinuria, arguing that maybe thin basement membrane isn't as benign as we used to think it is. 
Um, lastly, there was a cohort of about 13 cases uh, of patients who had thin basement membrane who studied over the course of 11 years. Um, mild acetemia, as defined by elevated creatinine and BUN, developed in one of these patients, while three of seven patients who underwent an inland clearance study actually had depressed um, uh, uh, clearances uh, at, at, at follow-up. So can we identify a subgroup of patients who's got thin basement membrane who can safely go on to donate a kidney? And you know these are not primarily evidence-based, uh, but it's kind of based on best guesses and also you know, professional opinion. I would argue that if you have thin basement membrane and you're older than 50, um, you had no family history of any kidney problems. There were no extra renal manifestation that might call into question whether this could be an early stage output or carrier state. Normal tensive, no protein in the urine, normal renal function, an absent GBM uh, lamination on EM with normal immunostaining for type 4 collagen. You could potentially go on to be a live kidney donor. Um, it calls into question as to what are the benefits of uh, genetic testing on top of all these different criteria. The, qu the problem is there's a lot of different mutations that can lead to the same phenotype and um, because of the different permutations and combinations, you can ne never say for sure 100% that the patient will not go on to develop any kidney problems afterwards. And as it turns out, we ended up ruling out uh, the donor in this case. Um, on her biopsy, her um, basement membrane was only 280 nanometers in uh, diameter, uh, whereas the standard was 326. Uh, and so we thought that at the age of 28, um, uh, with a family history of end-stage renal disease, and even though she's got no extra renal manifestation, uh, that she would be too high of a risk. Um, and lastly, uh, patients who either currently has or previously had kidney stones, how do we deal with these patients? Um, and um, basically, this group showed that um, over the duration uh, of the two NHANES study population, one, the first one spanning 1976 to 80, and the second group spanning 1988 to uh, 94, there's been an increasing incidence uh, and prevalence of kidney stones, uh, whether it be divided into gender, uh, race, or even age category. Um, within the kidney donor population, um, because we're now increasingly using CT angiogram as a study, uh, we're now picking up more incidental findings of nephrolithiasis that we would not normally have noted um, had we relied on older studies. Um, and basically, urolithiasis accounted for 42% of uh, exclusion within the group who uh, underwent CT angiogram as a routine uh, workup before the kidney donation, versus an older group uh, where only 20% of patients were ruled out because of kidney stones. Um, 10 living donors who had asymptomatic stones went on to, uh, to, to, to donate a kidney. And at follow-up of about 11 months for the donors and at 9.8 months for the recipients, uh, where 90% of the donors were actually contacted by phone, there doesn't seem to have been um, any stone-related morbidity identified. Um, so uh, they went on and did a perspective study uh, looking at the risk of recurrence of kidney stones in first-time stone formers who were completely asymptomatic. And they looked at uh, almost 200 patients, uh, seven and a half years of follow-up. 20% uh, of them had symptomatic recurrence. And of the 36 patients who had a follow-up ultrasound um, uh, in the follow-up period, uh, there was recurrent stones identified in the kidneys um, in another 28% on, in addition to the 27% who were symptomatic. Um, and interestingly, 22% um, of patients actually experienced a, a recurrence 10 years after the initial attack of kidney stones. So that would argue you're really never safe from a recurrence, no matter how much time you've waited out. Um, this other group uh, basically tried to look at 300 men who were completely asymptomatic with a kidney stone, and the mean cumulative kidney stone size was about 11 millimeters. Uh, and at 3.2 years follow-up, 77, so three quarters of them had progression in, in terms of the size of the kidney stone, and a quarter of them required surgical interventions. They found that the lowest risk categories were those who had a stone that was less than four millimeters that were located in the upper pole of the kidney. Um, and that elevated crea uh, serum and also urine uric acid um, correlated with increase in the size of uh, stone growth. 
Um, if you would ask the different transplant centers in the country as to how they deal with uh, donors who had kidney stones, um, whether they would accept them or not, um, there's actually a widespread. Um, most of them would say, yes, I would accept them, provided that they have a normal 24-hour urine for metabolic workup, whilst others would say, you know, I'll probably defer them. And interestingly, up to about 5% of uh, programs would actually um, don't have an established protocol for kidney uh, donors who has a stone. So what we do here at UCSF um, is that we've, again, none, none of this is you know, rooted in solid evidence base, but we had to come up with something. Uh, and this is probably the best that we could come up with. Acceptable donors were those who had a single stone uh, and has not had a recurrence in the last 10 years. Um, those who have an asymptomatic stone that was identified incidentally on a CT angiogram, and those who had low risk of recurrence. Well, what are the high risk of recurrence? Patients who've got cysteine and struvite stones, we know for sure that these come back. Um, who, those who have untreated hyperparathyroidism and hypercalciuria, type 1 RTA with metabolic acidosis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, especially those who had bowel resection because it just basically alters the way uh, oxalates absorbed in a, in a small gut. Um, uh, so those with sarcoidosis because of the reft up vitamin D production. And those who had either primary hyperoxaluria or those who had undergone uh, bariatric surgery with the old ruin Y uh, gastric bypass. Again, it somehow increases the oxalate uh, reabsorption in the GI tract. Nephrocalcinosis on CT scan and ultrasounds is a definite rule out. Uh, if you've got bilateral stones or patients who continue to develop new stones despite adequate therapy, and those in whom that there were multiple stones seen uh, concurrently uh, are, are ruled out as donors. Um, some of the gray areas include um, donors who maybe have a solitary stone within the last 10 years. How do you deal with those? We've arbitrarily used the 40 years of age as a cutoff. If you were younger than that, you're ruled out because there's too many unknowns. If you're older than that and it was your first stone uh, and you had none of those high re recurrence risk categories, uh, you could do a metabolic workup of a 24 hour urine collection. Uh, and if you were normal, you could proceed. Whereas if it was not normal, you'd be ruled out. Those who have more than two first degree relatives with a kidney stone, um, they would undergo a metabolic workup before we would accept them as uh, living kidney donors. Uh, and the evaluation basically includes a renal ultrasound or the CT angiogram, um, and it will undergo various serum testing and also urinary testing uh, to make sure that they have as low a risk of recurrence as possible. Um, you know, the, the 24 hour urine collection that we, we do currently basically gives you a random number for how much calcium, phosphate, uric acid citrate that you have in a 24 hour urine collection, which might not necessarily give you the whole picture because supersaturation of these different elements is what re you really would be interested in. And increasingly, we may be turning to this company that's uh, based in Chicago, uh, and some of you might have already encountered. And basically, they set up the whole thing with the patient. Um, they, they contact the patient and they send them the specimen for collection. Um, uh, and they give you a whole um, uh, report afterwards with super saturation levels. And um, we'll, we'll see how that works out. And uh, with that, I'm going to end my talk and uh, take any questions you have. Thanks. Okay, so, so the question was posed here uh, was that, you know, um, the, uh, the studies that were presented earlier on didn't really dif differentiate between essential hypertension versus those uh, who might have a secondary cause. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and that, you know, what are they, what are they, they, did the authors propose a hypothesis as to what the cause of accelerated hypertension in previous donors were? That was the first part of the question. So uh, to answer the question, I think, um, yeah, you're correct. They did not stratify these patients into those who had either high, uh, essential hypertension or those who had suspected uh, secondary forms of the hypertension. So uh, I, 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 I did not see any data uh, or any other investigators uh, who had uh, stratified these uh, donors into those two categories. Um, as to what the hypothesis is, I think it's probably, they, they, it, it, it wasn't, it was really just they, they didn't offer up an explanation of why this had happened. They just simply said that if you had a genetic predisposition and you had one of your kidneys taken out uh, by virtue of maybe um, hyperfiltration and whatnot, um, maybe that accelerates the development of hypertension or worsening control of previously diagnosed hypertension. But I didn't see any other studies or any authors who had, um, you know, presented any kind of molecular or biological explanation for why that might be. Uh, and then the other question was, um, there was some recent study about 
maybe t genetic testing for patients who's got a familial forms of hypertension or essential hypertension, and whether if that becomes widespread and available, whether it would factor into selection for, uh, for living donors. And I think that's probably going to be the case um, with the push for individualized medicine in the future, uh, but I think it's probably too early uh, for prime time right now. Okay, so the question was, w would we recommend treating previous donors preemptively uh, if they had a high risk for developing hypertension later on, even if they were not found to be hypertensive? Yeah, I, I guess you could you could make that argument, um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure there are going to be other side effects that antihypertensive medication is going to lead to, and I'm not sure that I would necessarily... Um, just because they have a risk factor of familial history, um, that they would definitely go on to develop hypertension. Uh, and, um, you know, we might be able to, uh, they, they might end up taking five or six years of potentially unnecessary medication um, uh, just for the prevention of hypertension, which they might get anyway in, in the future. So I'm not sure that I would necessarily recommend that at this point. Nice Damage. Right. Right, I mean, and I think that that point's well taken. That maybe if we treat them early, we can prevent the uh, end organ damage uh, sequelae of hypertension. But then that goes back to the importance of why we emphasize to all our living donors that we would want them to follow up with their primary care physician on a regular basis, if not six monthly, at least on an annual basis, so that if they do develop hypertension, that these gets picked up earlier on and that treatment gets initiated as soon as possible. Yes. Quick question. So I, I knew that was going to be a very involved discussion, and you know we wouldn't, I, I, it wouldn't allow enough time for a full discussion. That's why I didn't put that as a question. But to answer your question, we don't currently have a established policy. But every single patient who's got a first degree relative who has diabetes, uh, in addition to fasting glucose, we require that they do a two-hour postprandial glucose tolerance. Um, obviously, if they are normal on either the fasting glucose or the two-hour postprandial. Um, they're completely ruled out. But the gray zones involve patients who are maybe overweight, maybe prehypertensive, and has impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance. How do you deal with that? We've actually looked into this and spoke to one of our endocrinologists, and he's actually given us a couple of different calculators based on some of the studies that were done in the UK, in Nor Norway, and by plugging in some of those characteristics and numbers, it can actually give you a rough guide and estimate as to what the chance that person would go on to develop full-blown diabetes in the next 5, 10, 15 years would be. And um, we base we, we've been basing some of the decisions on those numbers that we get at 5, 10, and 15 years to counsel either for or against potential donors um, moving forward with donation. Have, based upon all the review you have done, have you developed any specific guidelines in terms of follow-up of these donors? Because we often get asked by the recipients sitting in the office uh, what kind of follow-up my brother or sister needs uh, once they have donated a kidney. Right. Um, so I think everyone heard that question. Um, so basically the follow-up that we are normally now recommending uh, is that at least on an annual basis when they have their routine visit with their primary care physician or a doctor of their choice that they get their blood pressure checked in the clinic, uh, they get a urine dipstick uh, looking for proteinuria because the dipstick, um, even though it's a very you know, primitive study, is actually pretty good at picking up uh, protein. Not so much for the microalbumin, granted, but full bone proteinuria, it's pretty good at picking up that. Uh, and then last of all, um, a creatinine evaluation, at least on an annual basis. That's what we're telling our donors right now. Um, increasingly, there's a push from the government uh, because um, they want to make sure that we are following up our living donors and that uh, we are ensuring that they're, they're, they don't have any adverse outcomes. And so we're going to be probably contacting our living donors at the six month, one year, two year, and three month mark, either through questionnaires uh, or maybe even if if, if the logistics work out, having them come back to the clinic um, at UCSF for follow-up appointments as well at those time points. Thanks. <laughs>